So the uh, the interaction on this round table is is actually not very interactive. It's through the chat. Uh, it, it just gets a bit chaotic if we start bringing people in, you know, because some people don't expect it or don't want it and so forth. Karen, hello, welcome. I think it's okay. I mean, do you have a hard stop, Jill? I mean, this is lasting about, uh, well, not about, this is meant this will last precisely uh, uh, 30, 30 minutes. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. All right. I have, we can hang for another couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see who else is joining here. So see a mix of people solution. Quite a lot of solution architects and engineers seems been on the round tables today. Uh, so a fairly techni technical crowd, one assumes, which may be incorrect, of course. We cannot assume anything. Yeah, it'd be good if everyone could um, maybe chat about themselves. Yes. <laughs> Let me just Don't be, take it. <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah. In fact, in fact, when when it's a smaller group like under ten people, is 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 quite interact. It can be quite interactive, but it really depends depends on the topic and the presenters and everything. Uh, the earlier session had about thirty people, but no interaction until well, afterwards. It is um, it is nearly four o'clock in the afternoon after what I'm assuming was a very exciting day of presentations. So we'll let everyone off. They're probably oh. going to have a cup of tea or something. Yes, yes, yes. And, and like like we were talking about, you know, people, especially in Sydney, stuck at home and with all the, the, the numerous other things happening. Okay. So look, it seems steady at eight people. So what I'll do is I'll just introduce you to the, uh, the round table on event streaming for hybrid cloud risk and reward. <clears throat> so, as you know, many of you know about hybrid cloud architectures are the new standard, right? They're being widely adopted in mid and large size companies. And the cloud first target is, 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 the, um, is, the, is the goal, going from legacy infrastructure, um, keeping it, but also integrating it and replacing it over time. So uh, most enterprises require reliable and scalable data integration with the legacy system. So for this round table, it's meant to be interactive. There will be some slides. And the objective is to explore the options, right? Um, and really have participants of the round table here um, solve some real-time data architecture issues and try and understand what can be required and what, what, what can be delivered, right? So this is the, the idea of uh, risk and reward. Is it, is it worth doing? Okay, so presenting today is Confluent. Uh, they're the original creators of Apache Kafka and uh, the original, if you like, or pioneering event streaming platform. Um, won't say too much about uh, Confluent, but importantly, we've got uh, Jill here today, who's VP of Solution Engineering at Confluent, uh, with a lot of different experience from IBM and New Relic over 20 years. Uh, being a technical consultant and now a senior leader uh, with, with, with her own team, I think, in, in the uh, Australian geography, but might be across uh, Asia Pacific. Is that right, Jill? Yes. The team, the team uh, yes, spans from Australia to India and up to Japan, Korea. Yeah. So so the framing here is it, it's not, not specifically a technical session, right? It's a it's bridging the, the business together. And because so much of this um, event streaming is about looking at the business, unlocking innovation, in other words, what processes would map readily or you know map onto the streaming services to bring a faster time to market, you know, and also making it a lot easier for development teams or at least empowering them. Okay, Jill, so um, I can see that we might need to have some uh, Introduction. I see that you have some some slides, and then what we can do is we we'll just take the questions and uh, from 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 the live chat, um, and and also from questions which came in through the registration process. If, that, if that's okay with you, Jill. Yes, sounds perfect. Thanks, Jonathan. 
Okay. Um, I love how you uh, protected my modesty by saying 20 plus. That was a good one. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, you, you guys can probably tell by my accent. I am not originally Australian. I um, originally from Scotland, but I've been in this side of the world for the last 18 years and um, working across a number of uh, technology roles from consulting through to pre-sales and now uh, leading a team at Confluent, which is really exciting. Um, looking forward to this session today and having a, a conversation around how event streaming um, can really help to cloud environments. So as Jonathan said, I've got, I think, literally three slides and then uh, um, we can go into the, the questions. Just to frame up um, why event streaming is important, uh, you know, Gartner has acknowledged that it's a requirement really to support real-time situational awareness uh, within an organization and so event streaming is really going to become the standard in in most organizations um, and why is that well it's probably <laughs> probably driven by the demands of um of the the customer like you and i and wanting everything um in the minute that that we expect it through the various uh apps and services that we engage with and so um the data within all of those systems is is constantly moving and it needs to you know be updated and reflected in those other environments in real time um now the interesting thing is with uh you know well obviously as jonathan said most organizations want to be cloud first but i'm pretty sure all of you in the room here today um, would recognize that really for most mid and certainly nearly all large organizations, there is a set of um, legacy applications and architecture uh, that just isn't going to readily move to the cloud. You know, some examples here, financial services being um, the obvious one and, you know, I, I, um, pretty much all of the big financial organizations still have mainframe. Um, that's probably the one that dates back the longest. And then, you know, next to that are systems like ERP systems like SAP, uh, and the list goes on and on. And so really uh, the hybrid cloud architecture is about blending um, those systems and data with newer cloud-based systems and minimizing um, any interruptions while that's that's all happening. Uh, and so by decoupling the, the data um, and also replicating it in the different environments, it enables the, um, the data to be extracted in real time and then makes it available for consumption by many other applications. Um, so, you know, essentially we're talking about uh, keeping multiple copies of the data in sync and ensuring it's in the right place at the right time. So what does that typically look like if you're not going to go down the event streaming path? Um, well, first of all, you know, you probably uh, talking about multiple data centers. I mean, there's an organization we're working with that even in Australia still has 30 data centers acquired through various acquisitions. Um, and then in addition to those multiple data centers that have a variety of applications in them, you also have uh, the, the cloud instances and teams and applications that have already moved there. So I think most organizations have taken the let's call it the low hanging fruit. So the cloud first strategy is often to separate off parts, um, you know, oftentimes the, you know, the apps and the customer facing components of your environment and build them cloud native in uh, typically one of the public clouds. So AWS, Google or, or Azure. But the question then comes in, how do you keep 
um, those newer applications fed with all of the data from the the legacy apps um you know and it's it can be you know operationally pretty complex you'll see there all the the multiple lines of data flow that goes from all the varying source systems into those new whether they be microservices or however your your cloud-based environment is built um and so, you know, everything can't be moved in one shot. That's the bottom line. I think we'd all agree with that. Uh, and a lot of what still remains in, in data centers are essentially the system of record for the organization. Um, the obvious one there would be customer data, right? And, um, you know, that might sit in, in an ERP system or in a core banking system. And how can that be unlocked and kept available to all of your other systems? Um, so the the way that um, this has been done in the past, and I guess you could, well, we would like to call it a, an anti-pattern, but you know, the typical approach to this looks like this diagram where there's a lot of HTTP requests that are set up. It's often you know, REST APIs, and it does work, can work pretty well initially, um, especially as you get started in cloud. But uh, there are several drawbacks to that. And over time, it starts to get really complex to manage. It gets hard to scale. Um, you know, there's a lot of different connections and um, sources and targets that have to be kept up to date to keep everything running. And so it's really not a, a scalable approach to, to hybrid cloud. Um, so what we're suggesting is really that event streaming is what's going to help um, streamline essentially the and future proof um, getting the data synced between your legacy applications and um, you know, your newer systems that sit in the cloud. It's much more elegant, and uh, in this case, it's centered around Confluent Kafka. Um, Kafka, as Jonathan mentioned, um, you know, is a, an event streaming platform. Uh, the Confluent founders were also the, the folks that built Kafka for LinkedIn um, in 2010. And um, it really allows for the migration to happen step by step. Instead of having all of those point to point connections, it's uh, essentially built around um, a central Kafka platform. So it decouples the two sides. And it means that you can publish the, the streams of data uh, from the on prem, like from your data center or centers into the Kafka environment and then replicate them out to the varying cloud regions that you have. We're talking here about hybrid cloud and really about the legacy data, but um, it would be remiss if I didn't mention now that, again, pretty much every large organization has many clouds, um, you know, probably uh, one, <laughs> at least one of each and then multiple AZs. Uh, and so this approach also then helps to support the, the multi-cloud environment where you can publish data into Kafka um, and then replicate it out to the varying cloud regions and environments so that um, the, the data in those cloud native applications uh, can stay in sync and um, also react as, you know, as events occur that information is then passed on and, you know, um, it's typically the modern applications and the things that we are using that sit in the cloud. And so I know that I have a high expectation around the, the, um, the speediness of interaction and how quickly transactions occur. Um, and so by putting Confluent in the middle, it basically helps to streamline the whole process. Um, you know, it helps to reduce the amount of maintenance that's needed, reduce operational risk, uh, and it helps to, 
you know, keep the data in sync and have everything in the one place. So it sort of de-risks the whole process, if you like. Um, I mean, I, I'll, this is the last section here. I think this probably covered most of this already, but um, by putting Kafka or Confluent in the middle, um, we're really, you know, uh, replacing the, the bottleneck or the multiple streams. Um, it makes it much easier. It makes it more cost effective. It reduces risk, uh, keeps all the systems up to date. And so fundamentally, it's um, a much easier and more streamlined approach to uh, bridging to cloud from legacy systems and then also bridging between clouds. And um, I'll pause there for, for breath and questions. I'm actually keen to, I don't know, understand, since there's not too many people here, keen to understand what folks' experiences are and um, how they built out their own hybrid architectures, if anyone wants to put their hand up. Apart from that, I am happy to answer any questions that have been put forward already or any questions anyone has. Well, I think that's pretty pretty convinced. You know, I'm I'm convinced. <laughs> that's a good but start. Also, <laughs> but re realizing that what you've described is is you know, a summary of the hybrid situation, right? Inevitable, and I w would assume that's also talking about on on premise as well, um, going from on premise to hybrid cloud, because uh, that was not mentioned. Yes. So, but in any case, yeah, the hybrid is. Um, maintaining essentially your on-premises on applications and also starting in cloud. So that is the, the nature of the hybrid. Great. Great, because we talked about legacy. And also you mentioned about the decoupling being the key issue here, decoupling of the data to maintain its uh, integrity, the scalability. Mm. So, so, okay, let's start with Karen. REST APIs, I'll leave you to read it, uh, uh, Jill. Can you see the... All right. Do thanks to Karen. Yes. Oh, off. thanks, Karen. Okay. Uh, so the question is, REST APIs are the backbone of the internet at the moment. Do you think event-driven can completely replace REST APIs for all use cases? Um, Karen, undoubtedly not. Uh, you know, and it's um, saying one size fits all for anything uh, <laughs> is never going to work, right? So... Um, there, there are absolutely places where, you know, REST APIs are going to remain. In fact, if it's, you know, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it in many respects. That's one of, <laughs> one of my personal philosophies. But as the complexity, um, you know, continues to grow and more and more moves into cloud, I think there will be a move towards more, you um, event-driven architectures because it does decouple the data and just make it easier for particularly for maintenance and, you know, um, easier to manage things like versioning and, you know, removing, um, not completely removing, but reducing breaking changes, for example, when you change uh, schemas and definitions and things like that. So bottom line, it probably won't completely replace it, but there's definitely um, an uptick in it. And uh, I would also say there are some very specific use cases that are kind of first in line, if you, you like. So often in large financial institutions, um, we're looking at the, you know, the payments processing or global markets data which really does require that um, real-time view. So those are the types of use cases that typically come first. So I think that's a good point on customer experience, going from the technology stack to the uh, customer experience. Um, you, you gave some use cases in your, in your, in your deck, um, but what, what would be kind of the steps to do this? Would it be working with the business to say, maybe we find a process like loan origination, something that is very asynchronous, 
something very event driven by its nature and then translate that into an architecture. Um, what are the key steps to, to doing this, setting up this hybrid data architecture and aligning it with the customer experience or the processes? It's, um, <laughs> it's a it's really a good question. It, well, it is, and it's a really great point. You raised uh, um, one of my favorite topics, Jonathan, which is um, you don't want to be a solution looking for a problem. Um, in other words, uh, you can't just, you know, say that we need to let's get a bit of Kafka in there because everyone's doing event driven. There has to be um, a legitimate business problem that is being solved. And that is always, uh, in my humble opinion, the best place to start. And so often those come from, um, you know, potentially it's uh, we're looking at some payment modernization at the moment across a few banks in in Asia, um, where specifically through COVID and the move to more digital transactions, their existing infrastructure hasn't been able to keep up with the, the growth in uh, digital transactions. And so there is a massive drive to change the, um, the way that payments processing is happening. So uh, that's a really big one. In terms yeah. of the, the move to cloud, it revolves very often around you know, customer data and customer experience. Um, and often those big old customer systems sit somewhere in a data center on premises. Um, and there's a need to sync that data with, um, you know, the, the apps and things that we're used to using that might be based in, in an AWS. Uh, and so, yeah, the, um, there's needs to be a problem that comes first and uh and there's plenty <laughs> there's plenty of those around at the moment as we all know yeah so it's taking that monolith i mean these questions are coming from people who wrote in and, and put their so they're from solution architects it engineers uh software engineers executives so, so you know as we get more granular in the job descriptions the questions become more tech technical yeah. but it's in, essentially you're going from the monolith into the hybrid environment and decoupling the data one question mm. came here is microservices versus event driven architecture uh, even Ooh. if that is is a is a situation right no is, is there, i think it's yeah. actually that's a it's a really good one i mean it's actually um event driven architecture supports microservices just like it supports um, a hybrid cloud environment. So, uh, because the, predominantly you can decouple the, um, or loosely couple, but essentially decouple the, the data from um, the applications and the, the sources and sinks, if you like. And so it's absolutely perfect for, um, you know, building out a microservices environment. Um, just as it is for building out a hybrid cloud environment. And those things can also be interwoven within the whole hybrid cloud piece. Possibly what you're building out in the cloud is a new microservices architecture. Um, and possibly, you know, what you've got in your legacy stack on premises that you have to update is a set of data. And so, yeah, it works across all of those uh, scenarios. Yeah. So on the on the point on the original question, which was around cus customer experience, um, you know, it's it's customer experience is, is driving the use, as Karen is saying, driving the use of event driven real time data. But it's also the other way around. You know, the technology can enable that. Right. So it's not that you have to build the technology first and then find the use case. Right. It's uh, they, they, yeah. they, they serve they serve uh, mutually, I guess. They they a hundred percent do yeah and the nature I should probably also add the nature of um, Kafka is such that uh, it makes it very easy to have um, real time copies of the data in those different environments and to keep all of those in in sync so that's fundamentally how um, a hybrid architecture gets supported. There's a way to bi-directionally sync 
the same data with the, each of those environments. So yeah, keeps everything up to date, whether it's the old world or the new world supporting whatever the application is. Yeah, yep. so uh, I think microservices can be event driven. Yeah, okay, so that's just reaffirming what you've said. Thanks, Karen. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. So this, these questions came in in quite a different ways, like how do I build my new data architecture? How do I go from S, uh, SQL into, into microservices? Questions like that. But in, in summary, uh, summarizing those questions, what data architecture strategies can be used to support a successful move from monolith to microservices? Data architecture strategies. Data architecture strategies. <laughs> um, well, I think domain, uh, for me, I like the, the domain-driven approach, which is, <laughs> I've got, got a small person appearing in the picture. Jess, what can you? <laughs> um, yeah, so the domain-driven approach, I think, is probably the best one, which is actually, again, around um, ensuring that you're solving an actual problem. So each of the uh, domains within an organization would decide what their application has to do, um, what the services are that they need to build to support that, and then what the, the supporting data is that they need. Um, and once they know the supporting data they need, they can figure out where to get it from. Uh, and that, with uh, from a confluent perspective, is where something like um, data governance and, and schema registry come in. So you can go into um, the schema registry and uncover what uh, data is already out there and have a look at the schemas and the information that's available. So you're not, uh, there's a, I guess, a large source of data that you can tap into uh, and figure out if it's fit for your needs. And then maybe you take some of that data from a topic, do something to it and add more value and you might publish it back into a new topic with its own set of definitions um, that you then make available to be discovered by the rest of the organization. So um, yeah, I think that's a, a kind of good approach of course there's the whole when it comes to architectures this concept of uh, the data mesh which is um yes. you know, gaining popularity as well yeah so i think actually you, you brought up a uh a quite a lot of stuff there what, right what? like what does good data what does good data governance look like and then you also mentioned something about there might be tools or resources hmm. like a repository and different maybe versions of the data yeah um you talked about earlier that you can manage change or risk i mean broadly you talked about risk and then you if i recall you were talking about changes in data right you're, you're breaking the data up into these domains so could you speak to that? I mean, a few questions there, I think, about governance and about tools to manage uh, the resources as events. Yeah, so um, there's a, a set of governance um, tools, essentially, that sit within the Confluent platform. One of the key benefits of those, as you just mentioned, is essentially allowing you to manage different versions of, um, of schemas or you know formats of data so what that means is yeah. if you've subscribed to a particular set of data and someone on the source side publishes a new version maybe they change i don't know the date format from one format to another uh you your downstream service doesn't get broken because you've subscribed to a different version of that so that is particularly helpful in the in the world of Confluent where, and in this whole <laughs> microservices world where things are changing all the time, right? You can just keep subscribed to the thing that works for you, um, be aware of changes and maybe adopt them down the line. So that's really critical. Um, also part of that, the, the governance piece is the ability to discover 
what data is out there available to you. So that's important. Um, there's the ability to, uh, you know, put data quality rules in there, data transformation rules as well. So that all sits within the, the governance profile and really is, is critical to that overall strategy. I would also add, though, the centre of the your data universe isn't just going to be confluent. And so um, that data governance information could then go into like an enterprise governance um, platform, uh, whichever one you happen to use or shared with other systems, because you're going to have, you know, data definitions and metadata from various databases and, um, you know, your analytics environment and everything as well. So. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not defining the governance processes, and uh, it's it's supporting it along with REST APIs, along with maybe async APIs as well. Yeah. Exactly. All of those things. Yeah. So look. Um, let's see. Can you believe it? Guess what? Time's up. <laughs> that was quick. I know, isn't it? <laughs> and my. My connection stayed alive. That's where we're winning. <laughs> yeah, and also, also that we we reliably no pets, but I think you had a nice interruption from from a kid or something. Just one child. <laughs> one child and internet held up. Okay, so let's see here. So um, yeah, so we we're around here for a bit. How can people contact you, Jill? I know Confluent is presenting. Look out for workshops. Look out for presentations on API days. I don't have the exact times, uh, but they're on the. Uh, uh, yes, so there were a few sessions. I think most yeah. of them have already run today. Yeah. Uh, you, everyone can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation that way as well. Um, and then we do have always a host of webinars. There's a great blog. There's actually a great developer site for Confluent that is a wealth of information as well. Um, so there are many ways to, to learn more, but I'm more than happy for folks to reach out to me individually as well. Yes, we have an exclusive membership here of eight members remaining on, on, the, on yeah, the chat. There you go. <laughs> so we're very, very fortunate here. Uh, so, Jill, yeah. thanks, for, thanks very much. Thanks for everyone attending. Uh, would you be okay to hang around on the chat for five minutes just in case anyone? Yes. Sure. So what I do is I'll formally end the session. I'll just switch off the video and the, uh, and the sound, but we'll be hanging around on, on the chat if that's, if that's good. All right. Thanks so much, Jill. Pleasure no problem. You. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to have you here. And thanks for keeping me honest. <laughs>